Hello, my name is Candace Savage, and I am the fortunate recipient of the Cheryl and Henry Kloppenberg Award for Literary Excellence for 2022. In fact, I am the lucky 13th recipient of this award, which each year recognizes a Saskatchewan writer who has created a substantial body of literary work and made a significant impact on writing in this province. Substantial, I can attest to. I've been at this for a while. As to significance, I have to leave that for others to judge. But I'm very grateful for this affirmation that my work as a writer matters and for the importance of literature in general. Think of all the people who, through those past 12 years, have received this award. Guy Vander Haag, Lorna Crozier, Sharon Butala, Diane Warren, Sandra Birdsell, David Carpenter, Jan Martel, Trevor Harriet, Sylvia Legree, Arthur Slade, Louise Bernice Half, Sky Dancer, and Bill Wazer. Think of the diversity and strength of the voices still to be welcomed into this circle. By shining a spotlight on this wealth of artistic talent, Cheryl and Henry Kloppenberg, you are doing a beautiful thing. Thank you. I'm speaking to you from my home, a few blocks from the South Saskatchewan River in this place we now call Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. This place and this community have provided support for and inspiration for my work as a writer from the beginning. The Saskatchewan Wheat Board, through their publishing arm, Western producer Prairie Books, gave me my start way back when, and you can't get much more Saskatchewan than that. When life sent me spinning away from Saskatoon for a decade, it was the Saskatoon Public Library that brought me back with an offer to, be, to serve as the writer-in-residence for a term. Over the years, I've been sustained by the writing programs at St. Peter's College and the University of Saskatchewan, and also by the Saskatchewan Book Awards, the Saskatchewan Library Association, the Saskatchewan Arts Board, and over and over again by the Saskatchewan Writers Guild. And here the Guild is again, providing a home base for the Kloppenberg Award. And of course, Saskatoon has also grounded my work in, and my whole life in very many other profound ways. Here I am on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis people. Here I am, born and raised on the prairies and with a deep sense of belonging here. And yet I'm the descendant of incomers from Western Europe. So what does it mean to be the descendant of settlers on this land? What does it mean to encounter this land and its beings, this land and its stories. So the other day I was looking after my little granddaughters and one of the things we always do together is read. Please grandma, read, don't stop, read, read, read. So I pulled out one of my own books. This one was published in way back in 2001. It, as you can see, is called Born to be a Cowgirl. Um, it's related to a, a book for adults. It's a children's version of a book that I wrote for adults at about the same time. And it um, coincided with me at the age of 50, deciding that it was time to actualize my fantasy of being a cowgirl and learning to ride a horse. Um, it was a delight to get reacquainted with this book, and so I'd like to read you just the opening little story from chapter one, which is called Born in the Saddle. Fanny Sperry admired a horse with spirit 
That was why she had decided to buy the bronc that was pacing around the corral at the Heron Ranch. She liked the way his hooves stirred the blue Montana dust. Most of all, she admired his strength and his wildness. The year was 1906, and Fanny was 19, a slender young woman with calm, knowing eyes that looked out from under the brim of her Stetson hat. Her entire attention was focused on the outlaw in the corral. He was a mouse-colored roan by the name of Blue Dog, and none of the cowboys on Heron Ranch could ride him. Get on board that one, they warned her, and you'll end up in the dust. But Fanny wanted to have him, and she was prepared to pay a good price. She had ridden over to the ranch on a gentle, well-trained mare, and she offered her own horse in trade for the unrideable blue dog. The cowboys accepted this offer and helped Fanny unsaddle her mare. There was only one small problem. Fanny still had to get back to her family's ranch up in the hills, since she no longer had a saddle horse. How did she propose to get home? Not a problem, Fanny decided. She would ride the bronc. Before anyone could stop her, Fanny picked up her saddle and climbed into the corral. Clucking and murmuring to the horse to calm him, she gently set the saddle on his back, drew the cinch under his belly, and pulled it tight. The men held their breath as Fanny swung onto the horse, but the explosion they were waiting for never happened. Blue Dog heaved and strained against the saddle, but Fanny quickly eased him into a walk. Then she turned that wild horse out of the gate and over the hills towards home. Isn't that a great little story? I have to say that the, the tiny detail in it that I like the most is the blue Montana dust. I don't know if it was blue, but I've always loved that color, that little detail in this story. The next piece I'd like to share with you comes from this book, Strangers in the House, a prairie story of bigotry and belonging, which was published in 2019. It tells the story of the first family to live in this house, whose names were Napoleon Sureau de Blondin and Clara Marie Perron. The Blondins arrived here in the early 1900s from a, a French-Canadian family um, and found themselves in a society that was far less welcoming than we might have hoped it would be. You know, even though they spoke a language officially recognized in this country, they were still the subject of um, intense bigotry, which eventually in 1929, just a year after this house was built, um, emerged in the form of um, an, an expansion of the Ku Klux Klan through Saskatchewan um, focused on Francophones and Roman Catholics and Ukrainian Catholics and anyone who was not white and Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. The book is less harrowing than that description might make it sound, I believe, because it does tell this very human story of this particular family. And because it's hard to extract um, a little piece, a nugget out of this complex tale, I'm just going to read you the ending. So at least you will know that it ends relatively well. You need to know that Diana is our now very adult daughter, um, who was a child when I moved into this house. And Keith is my dearly beloved. So, back in the house that Napoleon Blondin built, I sit at the dining room table, alone with my thoughts. Just there, on my right, is the place where we once kept Diana's tank of turtles and her cage of mice. Here, in this very house, 
is the place where Keith and I first met and started a conversation that has been running ever since. Here too, the Blondin granddaughters opened their family album and showed me a doorway into the past, an entry point I would not have discovered without their help. The world on the other side of that portal had turned out to be uncomfortable and unnerving, filled with events and players that were familiar, but that now appeared unmasked. Institutions that had always seemed normal suddenly became grotesque. My home society had been shaped by bigotry and racism. The truth. We live in a house of stories bequeathed to us by the past. It's no mansion filled with wonders. In fact, it is a fixer-upper in need of loving care. When we find cracks in the foundations and rot in the woodwork, then it's good to face up to the defects and bring them out into the light. And it is good, so good, to sit with one another and share our experiences. Stories are living things. They transcend boundaries and divisions. They seek common ground. There is room in our house of stories for everyone. The last reading I'd like to share with you today comes from a book um, that was published now a few years ago too. Um, it's amazing how time passes in 2012. Um, this book, A Geography of Blood, Unearthing Memory from a Prairie Landscape, tells the story of what I was required to learn by going back to the little town of East End in southwestern Saskatchewan, but the East End of the Cypress Hills, over and over again, over a period of a decade. And I'm just going to read you the, pre the prelude to this book. It is a book of prose, but this is in the form of a poem. We see them as a raven might see them from a distance. The men walk single file, dark strokes etched against an infinite plain of snow. Behind them, a day's straggling march to the south, lie a cold prison cell and the grim accusing faces of the great father's blue-coated soldiers. Ahead of them, if the spirits prove willing, are friends and family and the uncertain embrace of the great mother and her red-coated police. It is November 1881, already the dead of winter. The men walk with the ghosts of the buffalo. They are almost ghosts themselves. The soldiers have taken their rifles and ammunition, their torn lodges, their moccasins. They are hungry, the snow stings their skin. The police, it is hard to tell what the red coats have taken, are taking. The truth, Otapanehuen, the means of survival. Black wings rasp against the frigid air. Two men stumble, get up, fall. The leader of the travelers, that Niganit, looks up, then looks ahead to the blue smudge of hills on the horizon. That means, just like if we walk, if you are ahead, you are Kanikanit, the leader. Niganit is walking north, walking home, walking into another day. Somewhere up there in the distance, you and I are waiting, hungry for stories. Thank you.